Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer and Joel. We look forward to that. Well, good morning. We are going to continue our reading in the book of First Samuel this morning. Uh, this morning, our scripture passage will be First Samuel chapter 1, starting in verse 21 and continuing through chapter 2, verse 11. This scripture is um, in the Bibles on page 211 in the chairs in front of you, or it will also be um, behind me on the screen. Again, First Samuel chapter 1, starting in verse 21. If you are physically able, could you please stand to honor the reading of God's word? <coughs> Thank you. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 21. The man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him, so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him only. May the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, with her, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine. And she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, Oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, and the boy was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, the priest. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Your kindness to us, O Lord, is indescribable. Your kindness expressed at this moment in giving us your word that we might sit under it and benefit from it and grow. We thank you, Lord, that in your kindness you will minister to people who have walked into these doors in very, very different places. Praise you for your agility to do exactly that. And we ask for a miraculous work of the Holy Spirit as we approach this text. We love you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. In Psalm 150, Psalm 150, we encounter this call for worshipers to praise the Lord. Or as the psalm ends, let everything that has breath praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Some of you may recognize this exhortation from its inclusion in the modern worship song, Praise, which has been among the top five worship songs sung in America for a while now, but despite 
its recent popularity, it's an unusual exhortation, isn't it? Especially when we consider that these exhortations penned by human authors are ultimately breathed out by God because all Scripture is breathed out by God, 2 Timothy 3.16. So in a real sense, we have exhortations from God to praise God. Some of us have no problem with this at all. We encounter these exhortations, and we're immediately drawn in emotionally and responsive. We're, we're dancing around, praising the Lord, kind of like with my youngest daughter, if you drop any sort of beat at all, the shoulder starts bouncing a little bit, even in the grocery store, she might even take her thumb out of her mouth and, and get her hips. But some of us have more difficulty. We're not sure what to think. Perhaps because experientially we're not so sure if God is praiseworthy. We've asked for things maybe that we haven't received, so we feel forgotten or abandoned by God. We talked about this the past couple of Sundays. Or perhaps this exhortation feels manipulative. You know, shouldn't we decide if we want to praise God? Or perhaps this exhortation feels like an ego thing, the produce of a God who can't get enough of himself. Atheists and other non-believers regularly make this critique because they believe it disqualifies God from being God, or at least disqualifies him from being good, someone we want to believe in and worship. We can understand where this critique is coming from. Declarations of personal awesomeness combined with solicitations for praise in light of said awesomeness are generally off-putting in civil society. Instagram is this really odd exception. You know, influencers are all like, hey, here's, here's another picture of me looking awesome today. What do you think? And then their, their 5 million followers respond with, well, praise. You know, man, that's like the fifth time just today you've looked awesome. Here's another, here's another heart emoji or whatever. But setting that odd exception aside, if you wrote an op-ed for the Gainesville Sun exhorting local residents to praise you, such as with trumpets and lutes and harps and tambourines and dance and strings and pipes and cymbals and loud clashing cymbals, you can find all of that in Psalm 150. No offense, but people wouldn't do it. They would not do it. They would say bad things about you on Reddit behind your back. Which brings us, wouldn't you know it, to a praise song here in 1 Samuel chapter 2, Hannah's praise song in response to the birth of her son Samuel. We're unpacking that song together this morning, and my prayer is that this exploration will help us navigate some of the questions and the objections raised above, both for the sake of enhancing our worship of God and addressing skepticism and doubt. And yes, this is related to the help theme we're navigating this summer as we make our way through 1 Samuel, although possibly in ways you may not expect. Two reflections this morning. We're going to talk about, number one, the logic of our praise, and then secondly, the nature of our praise. The logic of our praise in the nature of our praise. First reflection, the logic of our praise. Last week when we began our first Samuel series, we considered the faithfulness of Hannah, who kept talking to God and trusting him, even as she walked through the valley of infertility and persistent needling by her rival, that's the word that's used in the text, by her rival Peninnah, who did have children. Both were married to Elkanah, and by the way, several appropriate pronunciations for that word, Elkanah, Elkanah, if you're more, if you have a southern persuasion, maybe. Both were married to Elkanah, an Israelite living in Ephraim, although this is very importantly, by no means, a divine sign-off on polygamy. By no means should we walk away from this thinking, well, you know, in cases of infertility, go ahead and find a second wife so you can continue your line, which was quite possibly Elkanah's reasoning for marrying Peninnah. 
This is really important. Genre matters a ton when we are studying and interpreting scripture, or as my French-Canadian professor put it in seminary, the genre. All of you English teachers and English majors out there, are, you're feeling awfully vindicated right now, aren't you? Your, your field matters to God. Amen? Be so encouraged. I, I, I bet you're tearing up. The genre of 1 Samuel is historical narrative, albeit with clear theological goals, with an agenda, as we'll be seeing. Historical narrative tends to be descriptive in nature, not prescriptive. The narrative will therefore describe plenty of events or circumstances that are not necessarily being endorsed, and the shape of the narrative will often give us interpretive hints. For example, the fruit of this polygamous marriage was clearly not great. There was rivalry, there was grief, there were all sorts of problems. So when we are studying Old Testament narratives, we can learn things from particular people and events, but we're not simply copying them. What we are mainly doing is observing various themes and principles that sharpen our view of God's character and mission, as well as our view of our identity and mission as God's people. On the other hand, the book of Titus, which we studied this summer, is a different genre. It's a letter written by the Apostle Paul to one of his co-laborers. Apostolic letters like Titus and and 1 Corinthians, which we studied before that, are more prescriptive in nature, although work still needs to be done to imply instructions given to Cretans, such as in Titus's case, or Corinthians, to our context today. They're more prescriptive, but we still have to do some work. Not only does this genre business help us rightly interpret and apply scripture, it also helps us respond to criticisms of Scripture which often have to do with genre confusion. I will hear people from time to time saying things like, well, my goodness, what kind of God would promote something and be okay with something like polygamy? That sounds really strange. Well, what if I told you that he, in fact, does not promote it and we need to have a chat about the genre? Back to the story. Hannah kept talking to God in the midst of her anguish, pouring out her soul to him in prayer. And in verses 19 and 20, God remembered Hannah, and she conceived and gave birth to her son Samuel. Remembered, not implying that God had forgotten her. He was always remembering her, and by extension remembering Israel, and this supernatural intervention was simply a very powerful manifestation of that remembering. And now we come to the passage we're considering this morning, which narrates Hannah's response to God's blessing. Really, her response is plural. So I promise we will get to this praise song in a moment, but let's, let's back up a step. First response from Hannah in light of Samuel's birth. Praise to God expressed through obedience. Recall that Hannah had made a vow before God, saying, this is back in verse 11 of chapter 1, O Lord of hosts, if, if you will indeed look upon the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. And now look at verses 21 through 28. She kept the vow. She raised Samuel until he was weaned, and then she brought him to the house of the Lord, the sanctuary at Shiloh, which is where Israelites living in Ephraim went to offer annual sacrifices and to participate in various festivals and feasts. At the time, and remember that the time we're in was the so-called time of the judges of Israel, probably here when Samson was judge. At the time, Eli was chief priest of the house of God at Shiloh, which meant that Hannah effectively placed Samuel under Eli's care. Verse 24 says that Samuel was young, probably around 
three years old since the weaning process, and that day was longer than it tends to be here in the West. And there her son would grow up as this priest in training, worshiping the Lord, and then ultimately remain there forever, verse 22, which meant that going forward, Hannah probably only saw Samuel annually when she and Elkanah made their pilgrimage to Shiloh to make their annual sacrifices. Why did she keep this vow? Because she had to? Well, I mean, God, listen, God wasn't going to rain down fire upon her if she hadn't. And though it's, it's not entirely clear here, it's possible that Elkanah, according to a provision in the law, you can see this in the book of Numbers chapter 30, may have been able to nullify Hannah's vow. But he didn't. Because he read the room. See verses 22 and 23, and could tell that Hannah was determined to keep the vow because she wanted to. And she wanted to on account of her gratitude for the Lord's provision. Which makes a huge point about the nature of obedience. Spiritual obedience is motivated by joyful gratitude, which is catalyzed by trust in God's wisdom and provisions. And so it is that our obedience ends up being an expression of our joy in being the Lord's people that actually enhances and completes our joy. And this is true even if the earthly cost of our obedience is monumental. And it certainly was for Hannah. Her obedience meant parting ways with her young son, at least for the most part. The son she had waited years to hold and to nurse. If you find this obedience and joy connection difficult to process, and such is the case for many of us, consider how the Lord leads his people into obedience. Have you ever thought about this? Does he stand behind us with a whip and kind of yelling at us, you know, all right, you know, get on with it now. Obey. No. He goes ahead of us and he blazes for us a trail to follow, calling us along the way that we might hear his voice and come after him. Do you see the difference here? And all of this comes to a head in Jesus, who literally blazed a trail for us by means of his life and ministry, the example par excellence of faithful obedience unto God the Father. And then Jesus essentially attracts us along this same path. I'm referring one more time to the book, The Lord of Psalm 23 by David Gibson. He attracts us along this same path by means of his shepherding voice, heeded by his sheep who know and love and trust his voice. He does not stand behind us with a whip. He goes in front of us and blazes a trail and then calls us as the great and good shepherd to follow him. Obedience, church, is going where Jesus has already gone with Jesus as the guide, which means it's probably pretty good. And by the way, do you notice that God worked through Hannah's obedience to make a miraculous provision for Israel? Eli's sons served as priests who were supposed to be helping Eli attend to the house of God, the sacrifices, the feasts, all of that. But they were making, I mean, a huge mess of things, folks. The biggest mess you could possibly make, we'll see this next week, because the text says they didn't really know the Lord. It's a big problem if you're a priest in Israel. And therefore, they were putting Israel's corporate worship at risk. This is a big deal. So Samuel ends up being a replacement for these sons, a very faithful replacement. And check this out. Even though Elkanah was living in Ephraim, he was actually 
a Levite. You can see this in the First Chronicles chapter 6, which meant that Samuel was a Levite, part of the Levitical line, specifically set aside by God for priestly service. Church, God works through the obedience of his people to provide for his people, which means our obedience is never arbitrary, it's never in vain, it's directly connected to our flourishing as God's people. First response from Hannah, praise to God expressed through her obedience of dedicating Samuel unto the Lord for temple service, and man, they were really grateful. It says they brought a three-year-old, well, probably, probably actually three of them, a lavish sacrifice of praise. They were blown away with gratitude at what God had done for them. First response from Hannah, praise to God expressed through obedience of dedicating Samuel. Second response, a song of praise which you can find in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. If you had any doubts about the joyfulness of Hannah's obedience, doubt no more. Look at this. My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Even in leaving her son at the temple, Hannah is overwhelmed with joy and praises God accordingly. Truthfully, the song of praise begins with her announcement to Eli at the end of chapter 1 when she arrived at Shiloh with Samuel, verses 26 and 27. Oh, my Lord, that is Eli. Eli, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who is standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed. And look, the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Sharing our praise with other people enhances our enjoyment of it, doesn't it? It's why we go to live concerts and athletic events rather than just watching them by ourselves on TV, unless it's too hot, right, in which we will wait a bit and enjoy the benefits of communal praise later in the fall. Amen. So in Hannah's case, it's not, well, you know what? I'm obligated to tell Eli, so let's check this box. She clearly couldn't wait to tell him. She couldn't help herself. Look. Look what God has done. I was praying for this, and you gave a blessing, and look what he's done. And then the song, which very noticeably, as we will unpack in a moment, celebrates the God behind the provision of her son more than the provision itself. Which is why she can, in fact, give up her son and still praise the Lord. Think about it, if her contentment and joy were ultimately wrapped up in her son, there would be no song. But her contentment and joy are in the Lord because she believes that he sees her and remembers her, and she has evidence to back this up, and she therefore trusts his wisdom and providence, basically his his purposeful sovereignty over all things. And so she sings, because celebrating the Lord enhances and completes her joy. A number of years ago, Steve Martin and the Steep Canyon Rangers wrote a song called Atheists Don't Have No Songs. And even without hearing it, you can probably guess the logic of it. Atheists don't have no songs because they don't believe in the God we're singing about. But you know who else don't have no songs? or at least only have songs, sometimes Christians who are wrapped up with the things that God gives more than they are with the God who gives them. But God always sees us and remembers us and remains with us, even when we are dropping off our son at the temple for the rest of his life, which means we always have a reason to sing. Sometimes we forget that, though, don't we? Especially in the valley season. And that forgetfulness diminishes our desire to praise the Lord. It diminishes our want to. Thus, the exhortation we find in places like Psalm 150, to praise the Lord. They are a nudge. They are a blessing from God, our helper, to help us get our praise on again. Yes, for the sake of His glory, but also for the sake of our joy and contentment. Many of us think to ourselves, well, I'll I'll start praising the Lord again whenever I start feeling like it. 
which makes a lot of sense in our age of authenticity. No one wants to be inauthentic. But here's the thing. Praising the Lord isn't just an overflow of our contentment and joy in the Lord. It also helps us recover our contentment and joy, in part because it helps us remember the reasons that we have to praise Him. So do you see the logic of our praise, both in our obedience and in our singing and so forth? In praising the Lord, His glory as well as our joy and flourishing come together perfectly. Do you believe that you have a reason to praise the Lord? Do you really believe it? It's worth investigating. Some of us believe it. Some of us aren't sure. Some of us have been singing, and we're not sure if we really have a reason. We're just kind of showing up and participating. Do you believe that you have a reason to praise the Lord? Now, about the praise song itself. What does it teach us about God, our helper, and even the way in which we should go about praising him? Second reflection, the nature of our praise. We already alluded to this, but the nature of Hannah's song, which, by the way, is more of a poetic prayer than a song, it's profoundly God-centric. It's ultimately about him, which tells us something about how we should praise God through singing or writing poems, you name it. Less references to us, more references to God. Right worship of God pulls us outside of ourselves and therefore aids our pursuit of self-forgetfulness and once again, our joy. Verses 1 through 3, the song is about God's sovereignty, his purposeful, comprehensive reign over all people, things, events, you name it, to the point that there is no one like him. He is incomparable. Verse 2, Hannah rejoices that the Lord has sovereignly given her salvation, that is, help in the form of deliverance from her childlessness and despair, and she is now victorious. Her horn is exalted, this Verse 1 gets at this kind of mentality like the, the horn of an animal being lifted up in victory. And so Hannah derides her enemies, verse 2, not vindictively, but with her mouth. Not with gloating, not with bragging, but with this song. She's praying unto the Lord. Her enemies, such as her rival Peninnah, they were mocking her for her childlessness as if she was Worthless, as if she was a disgrace, forgotten by the Lord. So Hannah counters her enemies with praise to the Lord for delivering her and demonstrating that actually the opposite is true, that the Lord has not forgotten her. I wish I had an hour to talk about this, but when God tells us not to avenge ourselves, such as in Romans chapter 12, verse 9, he's not saying that we cannot counter our enemies at all. That's not the point. The opposite of vengeance isn't do nothing. What we're doing is entrusting ourselves to our sovereign Lord and rejoicing in Him accordingly, confident that He will uphold us and vindicate us. So instead of taking vengeful, horizontal action, we take trusting, joyful, vertical action, which is how our praise ends up being a weapon of sorts in the presence of our enemies. You said this about me, not true. And accordingly, I will praise the Lord. Verses 4 through 8, this song is about the Lord's mysterious ways, how he acts very surprisingly in history, especially in humbling the mighty and raising up the lowly. It applies, you can see this in the text, to military combat to the economically and socially disadvantaged, to the domestically disadvantaged. Verse 5, the childless bear children, seven being the, the, the number of perfection, while the one who has children is now forlorn, is wasting away. It applies to those experiencing excruciating life circumstances, essentially being brought down to Sheol, the place of the dead, before being revived or, or brought up by the Lord. Verse 6. The point is that it applies to everything. And it's Proverbs 3.34 and James 4.6 brought to life. God 
opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And then finally, verses 9 and 10, this song is about the sovereign Lord judging the wicked, that is, his adversaries, and then raising up a king, in part to accomplish all of the sovereign reversals mentioned in the early part of the song. It's fascinating, really fascinating, that Hannah would include this bit in her song about the Lord giving strength to his king and exalting the horn of his anointed since in that moment there wasn't yet a king in Israel. It's almost as if Hannah had some kind of divinely given perception, especially in light of Samuel's miraculous birth. She was pondering all of this in her heart and realized, listen, some sort of change is in the air here. Some sort of special help is on the way. She could perceive that. And as we will see as we make our way through 1 Samuel, It certainly was, starting with Saul and then David. But you know what else we'll see? That that help in the form of earthly kings was a mixed bag because human beings, even at their very best, remain flawed morally, physically, you name it. We make moral mistakes, we get tired, They can help, but they always leave something to be desired. And whatever deliverance they provide always feels either incomplete or precarious. The good news, City Church, is that other miraculous births were yet to come. And other songs. Elizabeth, childless and advanced in years, conceived John the Baptist shortly after the angel Gabriel made a visit to her husband Zechariah. And then the angel Gabriel made another visit. Gabriel was very, very busy during this season. This time to Mary, showing her that she would conceive a son, and that she should call his name Jesus, and that he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him, check this out, the throne of his father David. And then when Mary visited Elizabeth, who was her relative, and when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, Luke chapter 1, verses 41 through 42, tells us that the baby, that is Elizabeth's baby John, leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you, that is Mary, among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Why the leap? Why John's leap in the womb of his mother Elizabeth? Because he couldn't help himself. It was a prophetic praise leap, if you will, in light of what was coming. And here's what was coming. A king who would, Luke chapter 1, verses 32 and 33, be given the throne of his father David and reign over the house of Jacob forever. That's an arresting consideration. No end to this reign. John leapt. and Mary sang. After John leapt, in Luke 1, 46 through 55, Mary sang a responsive, poetic praise song very similar to Hannah's song thematically. A song celebrating God's sovereignty and strength. The sovereign Lord who has done and is doing great things on Mary's behalf by means of an unexpected child. The sovereign Lord who humbles the proud and exalts the humble. The sovereign Lord who ultimately helps his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. Same themes that Hannah was singing about now applied to Mary in Luke chapter 1. And this king was coming to provide comprehensive help, physical help, emotional help, and very importantly, spiritual help. Help that we all need, not just the Israelites. Because here's the thing. We're just like the earthly kings, aren't we? Morally flawed 
self-interested, inclined to believe, even if quietly, that we know more than God. So before you get excessively mad at a bad king, think about your own tendencies. Those of us who are walking with the true King Jesus, praise the Lord, as in, praise the Lord for his mercy in helping and delivering you, attested entirely to his providence and love and compassion, owing nothing to you. And also, keep praising the Lord Wake up tomorrow morning and praise God that his, his mercies are new again. Keep praising the Lord for his incomparable sovereignty and omniscience. The one who knows and sees all things. For his activity in exalting the lowly and, and humbling the proud. For his activity in judging righteously and vanquishing his enemies. And then, of course, ultimately for providing a true and perfect king in the line of David. My guess, though, would be that there are those here this morning who are not walking with the true King Jesus. And that's our intention. Our place is to be for everybody. This is a, this is a room. This is a church family for those walking with Jesus, those exploring Jesus, those who are honestly really frustrated and angry and wrestling. This is for you. Those of us not walking with the true King Jesus, you need help. You need help. You need salvation. Because if we were talking about in 1 Corinthians, Titus, every single one of us is inclined, instead of humbly submitting ourselves into a loving God, every single one of us is inclined to put ourselves on the God seat and to live how we want to live in rebellion to God for our own gratification, thinking that we know better than God. Sin that separates us from God. But God has made a way for such people, dead in their sin, Ephesians chapter 2, to be made right with God. He has sent a king, a king foretold in 1 Samuel chapter 2, confirmed in Luke 1. This is a king for everybody. Would today be the day of salvation when you repent of your sin, you set it aside, and in turn toward Christ the King, putting your whole hope upon His grace. The day is the day of salvation. Christianity is simultaneously exclusive and inclusive. It's exclusive in the, in the sense that the only way to be reconciled with God is through King Jesus, but it's inclusive. It's for everybody from all walks of life, all ethnicities, all races, all backgrounds. I don't have to know a single thing about your story to know that King Jesus is for you. And I hope that you will put your faith in him today. Amen.